Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar titled Optimizing Image Guided Laser Induced Choroidal Neovascularization in Mice. My name is Nick Glover from Inside Scientific and I will be your host for today's event. A warm welcome to those of you who are online today. Thank you for being with us. Our session today is sponsored by Phoenix Research Labs and we are joined by Scott Johnston, Vice President of Operations and Sales at Phoenix Research and Dr. Yan Gong from the laboratory of Dr. Lois E. Smith at Harvard Medical School. The application focus for today's event is the protocol optimization for image-guided laser-induced choroidal neovascularization in the mouse model. Specifically, Dr. Gong will discuss a documented study from their team at Harvard Medical School, which outlines a protocol to achieve consistent and reproducible results with an image-guided laser photocoagulation system. Thank you, Nick. Uh, my name is Scott Johnson. On behalf of Phoenix Research Labs, I'd like to welcome all of you to our webinar. As you know, we'll be hearing from Dr. Yan Gong from the laboratory of Dr. Lois E. Smith at Harvard Medical School as he discusses his methods for creating consistent and reproducible laser-induced CNV in the mouse using image-guided laser. Dr. Gong and his team used our Micron 4 CNV system in their study and we're excited and honored that someone like Dr. Gong would invest the time to write a paper explaining the procedures and methods needed to create consistent CNV. Using our image-guided laser injector, researchers are able to create real-time photocoagulation using bright field images, aiming the beam and adjusting the laser settings to deliver the energy to a specific location is possible. Viewing and documenting of pre- and post-laser treatment spots is easy with the Micron 4. Our image-guided OCT adds a deeper level of insight into the process of CNV. For assessment, an and OCT scan can be precisely located over the area of energy deposition. 3D information can also be obtained and vertical scans can be used to delineate the extent of neovascularization and layer location. Each part of our CNV system provides you with control and insight into making the study successful. Thanks very much for Scott. A wonderful introduction. It's my great pleasure to join this webinar and share our experience on laser-induced corridor neovascularization model using this image-guided laser system with you. The laser-induced corridor neovascularization, the CNV, is an animal model for age-related macular degeneration, which results in a vision loss in the center of the visual field. According to data from 2012, AMD affects over 16 million people in United States and Europe in 2011, and annual incidence is expected to increase with a aging population, and prevalence in Western countries is anticipated to reach 25 million by 2020. There are two types of AMD. The dry form of AMD results from atrophy of the retinal pigment epithelial layer below the retina, which cause, causes vision loss through loss of photoreceptors in the central part of the eye. The white form of AMD, also called neovascular AMD, causes vision loss due to abnormal blood vessel growth, which is CMV. Around 10% of AMD patients exhibit wet AMD. However, it accounts for over 90% of the serial, serious loss of vision. Wet AMD is characterized by CNV, with blood vessels penetrating through the bruised membrane into the normal vascular subretinal space, therefore developing a reproducible model that mimics the process of CNV is needed to get better understanding of the pathological AMD, especially wet AMD. The laser-induced CMV model was first described using monkey in 1979 and then adapted to rodents. This model successfully mimics new vessels arising from the choroid to subretinal space through bruise membrane, which happens in wet AMD. This model in mice can be used in transgenic animals to explore the molecular mechanism of neovascular AMD. However, the disadvantages of this mouse model include there is no macular in mice. This 
pathological process is not initiated with aging changes. And it also differs from AMD as it is a wood healing model involving inflammation. Despite these disadvantages, the laser-induced CMV model are now frequently used to study CMV and evaluation of anti-angiogenic drugs. And it has been successful in predicting the clinical efficiency of anti-vascular and senior growth factor, the anti-VEGF therapy for neovascular AMD. Therefore, optimizing the, this mouse model will make it more reproducible and extend its use. Here is a brief experimental flowchart for the laser-induced CMV mouse model, modified from the Nature Protocol paper by Vincent Lambert. I will discuss the detailed information step by step later. First, the integrity of the mice eye should be checked. Only intact eyes without any structural abnormalities can be used. The abnormal structure in will influence the efficiency of the laser photocoagulation. After integrity check, the mice can be pretreated if needed. Next is laser burn. After anesthesia and pupil dilation, laser burns will be induced. Optical coherence tomography, the OCT, after laser burn can be used to make sure the photocoagulation is successful. This step is optional. After laser burn, different treatments can be implemented, such as intravitreal injection, IV injection, IP injection, oral garage, and food or water administration. Lesion leakage can be investigated six or seven days after laser photocoagulation by Founders Florence Angiography, the FFA. Photos can be taken after IP injection of Florence dye at different time points for evaluation of CMV lesion leakage. The area of CMV lesion can be quantified in isolectin B4 stand corridor flat marks seven days after laser photocoagulation. The volume of CMV lesion can, be, can also be examined by OCT optionally. After, at the same time, different tissue samples can be used for RNA, protein, or metabolomic study. There are two different ways to generate laser burns in the mouse eye. One is the conventional sleep lab, and the other is the image-guided laser system, the micro platform. In my opinion, compared to the sleep lab, micro four system is more convenient for studies on small animals, such as mice and rats. No covered glass is required to convert the corneal surface to a planar surface using the micro system. The laser spot in this image-guided laser system can be easily moved and focused mechanically instead of manually when using the sleep lab. And the micro platform also has compatible OCT, FFA, and electroretinography, the ERG components that may be used for analysis of ocular structure and the function. However, with this image-guided laser system, the size of the laser spot cannot be adjusted as it can be within the sleep lab. Therefore, fine adjustment to focus the laser spot for each lesion is required to properly induce the laser burn. Next, I will share our experience on even focus. Mouse is placed on the mouse holder, which is indicated by letter D in the panel A of this figure. The lens should be positioned about five millimeters away from the cornea, while the major retinal vessels and the optical nerve head can be observed by adjusting the lens focus. The optical nerve head should be positioned in the center of the visual, visual field through adjusting the horizontal position I move the base of the mouse holder, which is indicated by letter A here, and adjusting the vertical position by turning the node B. 
then the lens should be slowly advanced by turning a knob under the microscope until it gently contacts the cornea. There is usually a tiny move of the eye because of the touching, so the optical nerve head should be repositioned in the center of the vision field uh, described above. After that, adjust the lens focus until nerve fibers can be observed. If the fibers cannot be observed evenly throughout the whole eye, as shown in this figure, only bottom part is visible, but the upper part is invisible. This means the eye axis and the lens axis are not aligned well. There is an angle between the eye axis and the lens axis, which will affect the focus of the laser spot. If you see the difference between the upper and the bottom part of the visual field as, above, as this figure show, you can rotate the eye by turning the knot C. If you see the difference between the left and the right part, you can rotate the eye by turning the mouse holder D. We should make the angle, the angle between eye axis and the lens axis to zero. After that, reposition the optical nerve head back in the center of the visual field by moving the base A for horizontal movement and turning the knot B for vertical movement. The reflection of the retinal nerve fibers should be evenly bright and clear in all directions, as shown in this figure. The precise alignment together with accurate focus is essential for consistent laser burns in the eye. After you see this, adjust the lens focus for clear fundus observation but not retinal nerve fibers, and now it is ready for laser burns. We recommend four laser burns per eye. Too many will easily lead to fused lesions. The laser shots can be generated at 3, 6, 9, and 12 o'clock position, or in the center of the four individual quadrants, and at the equal distance from the optical nerve head. The distance between the center of the laser burn to the center of the optical nerve head should be optimally about double the diameter of the optical nerve head. The distance between the edges of them should be more than the diameter of the optical nerve head. The distance between the edges of the laser shots should be more than two times of the diameter of the optical nerve head. Major retinal vessels, the red ones as you see in this figure, and the corridor vessels, the pink ones you see here in this figure, should be to prevent potential bleeding. The formation of a vaporization bubble immediately after laser photocoagulation indicates the success of a laser burn, which correlates with a rupture of bruise membrane. Both three and uh, two and three dimensional OCT images can be used to confirm the bruise membrane rupture. No bubble indicates no bruise membrane rupture. No bruise membrane rupture will not yield the CMV. This video will show you how the vaporization bubbles look. The bubbles will arise immediately after laser shot. It will expand and then shrink quickly. After that, you can see a hazel around the laser burn and a bright spots in the center. Lesion leakage and area can be assessed for statistical analysis about one week after laser photocoagulation. Left panel are FFA images taken by the microscope on the micro platform at different time points after IP injection of fluorescence dye six days after laser photocoagulation. The red panel are representative images of corridor flat marks with isolectin B4 standing seven days after laser photocoagulation. Detailed information about the grading of lesion leakage and the quantification of lesion area can be found in our previous publications. 
The laser-induced CMV model in mice has been often characterized as variable and uh, incons inconsistent. Establishing a set of consistent exclusion criteria is necessary for ensuring reliable data analysis. In a typical study, 10 mice per group with four lesions per eye would optimally provide 80 data points for each experimental condition. However, the following situations will lead to data or loss or mouse loss. First is cataract and uh, corneal epicenial edema before laser photocoagulation. This figure shows the mild and the severe situations. The clouding of lens in the eye significantly influences our focusing on the fundus and will decrease the efficiency of the photo laser photocoagulation. The second issue is unsuccessful laser burn without gross membrane rupture, as I discussed in previous slides. Next one is the odd lesion shape due to mouse movement during laser photocoagulation. This figure shows two representative images how these odd lesions look like. These odd shapes will lead to irregular CMV lesions and inconsistent quantification of lesion area later. The other two reasons for, of laser or of data or mouse loss are death of mice after laser photocoagulation and, de and damage of the CMV lesions during tissue dissection and processing. In addition to those situations I introduced in the last slides, some other lesions should be excluded from statistical analysis to accurately evaluate the area of CMV lesions. There are five provisions in, my, in our exclusion criteria. First is hemorrhage. Severe hemorrhages will cause much larger CMV lesions, so the corridor hemorrhages should be analyzed and classified carefully. We grade the bleeding to three levels. If the diameter of bleeding area is less than that of the lesion, it is grade zero, and these lesions can be used for statistical analysis later because these slight hemorrhage do not significantly affect CMV. Next, if the diameter of bleeding area is more than that of the lesion, but less than twice of the lesion diameter, these hemorrhages will be classified to grade one. These lesions should be excluded from quantification. If the diameter of bleeding area is more than two times of the lesion diameter, it is grade two. In this case, all the lesions in the same eye should be excluded from statistical analysis because these severe hemorrhages will affect the microenvironment in the whole eye and influence the forming of other CMV lesions in the same eye as well. The second issue is corridor damage. Normal laser shot break the bruise membrane, but not corridor layer. But excessive laser burn damages not only bruise membrane, but also the corid and the retinal pigment epicenium, which will yield a CMV lesion much smaller than the fellow lesions in the same eye. This excessive laser, bur laser burn can be seen as a solid hole in the bright field microscope image of corridor flat match. The other three types of exclusive lesions are fused lesions, outlier lesions, and the lesion which is the only one eligible lesion for statistical analysis among all lesions in one eye. About the outlier lesions, the IOVS paper by Stephen Paul gave very detailed introduction. Generally, generally speaking here, there are lesions too bigger, over five times larger, or too small, less than one-fifth. For detailed information about the outlier lesions, you can check our plus one paper or this IOVS paper. To find out the optimal laser power we should use for the laser-induced CMV model in mice using the Micro 4 image guided laser system, we tried different laser powers from 180 to 360 milliwatts with a 
an identical duration of 70 milliseconds in C57 black 6J mice. In this table, we can see that 240 milliwatt is the best among these laser power levels we tried. It has the highest percentage of eligible lesions for statistical analysis. If less than 240, the percentage of no bruise membrane rupture will significantly increase. If more than 240, the percentage of severe hemorrhages, corneal damages, and the fused lesions will increase. The quantification results suggest that the CMV lesion area is positively correlated to the laser power level. To clarify how the age and the gender of animals affect the area of laser-induced CMV lesion, I assessed four different groups of C57 black 6J mice with different combination of age and gender. The quantification results indicate that older mice develop more severe and uh, various CMV lesion than the younger mice, especially the older females. The gender difference is only significant in the older mice, but not in the younger mice. Therefore, we recommend both the male and the female mice at six to eight weeks old can be used for the laser-induced CMV model. After determining the optimal parameters for both the machine and the mice, we applied this model to evaluate the effects of dietary intake of omega-3 long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acid on laser-induced CMV lesions. We began the omega-3 or omega-6 long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acid enriched diet one week before laser photocoagulation and collected the choroids seven days after laser shot. The quantification results suggest omega-3 long-chain polyunsaturated uh, fatty acid suppressed laser-induced CMV development and may have beneficial effects on the neovascular AMD. The take-home messages for today's webinar are the following. Mice at six to eight weeks of age are ideal for laser-induced CMV model. Even focus is essential for producing consistent laser photocoagulation. Formation of a vaporization bubble indicates successful laser shot. Laser shot at 240 milliwatt for 70 milliseconds is optional for C57 black 6J mice. Exclusion criteria are necessary for evaluation of CMV lesions. At last, I want to say that we have no financial interest in Phoenix Research Labs. This work is primarily finished by Jie and me with excellent direction from Dr. Lo Smith and Dr. Jin Chen, as well as great help from the other lab members. Thanks to the Phoenix Research Labs for their wonderful technical support. Thanks to Inside Scientific for their effective effort for the like organization of this webinar. Our question and answer period, and I think we've you know we've got some great questions coming in. I think we're going to let you know Dr. Gong field most of these, as the majority of them are related to your your research study, at Dr. Gong, and the protocol that you guys have put forward. So um, let's get started. And so, question number one: Is there an optimal age? Uh, animal age for inducing the CNV model? According to our uh, experience and our uh, results, and as well as uh, the uh, detailed information from the LVS paper by Stephen Paul, the younger mice around 60 to, six to 8 weeks old um, much better uh, ages for the laser induced CMV model because they generate more consistent CMV lesions and uh, those and there is no gender uh, difference between the mice at this age. Okay. Okay, great, thank you. And <clears throat> how are you evaluating the CN CNV with 
with the uh, OCT module? Like, how, how are you setting that up? Uh, yeah, both, both the three and uh, two and three dimensional OCT can be used to assess the uh, region area. Maybe uh, seven days after the photo calculation, and the three D they could uh, imagine the uh, area of the laser induced seven level, and the three D OCT could measure the volume of this uh, OCT uh, of this region area, and maybe uh, Scott can give more detailed information about how we using the OCT to measure a specific area of uh, in the, in the mouse eye or some uh, in the eye of some small animals. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Gong. So, as uh, Dr. Gong pointed out in the seminar, uh, there are there, the use of the OCT is pretty common for the CNV studies. What it allows you to do is to take a 3D image. You can take an individual slice from that 3D image about the same level as the CNV. We can take that slice and then use our insight analysis software to evaluate uh, the area of that particular slice. So it's a great way to uh, really check to see if you're seeing advancement of your particular CNV. Great. Uh, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. I was very detailed and, and well informed. Uh, so does the laser spot size affect the CNV formation? Uh, usually the larger laser spot size will uh, generate larger CMV regions and uh, but if the laser spot if if the laser spot is too larger they will generate very uh, variable CMV regions like someone will become uh, very larger and um, there are maybe outlier uh, regions so we suggest that we should uh, make consistent laser spot Maybe it's for some reason it should be uh, relative smaller and to generate more consistent uh, laser induced CMV regions. Okay, great, great, thank you. And, and Dr. Gong, have you tried to do ERG analysis of the laser lesions? Uh, have you tried that before? Uh, no, because uh, this we're using the laser induced CMV model uh, for the AMD as a sh short uh, as a animal model at a short age uh, at a short uh, time time range. So if we want to check uh, some uh, effects of laser induced in the eye for a longer time, maybe the ERG is uh, is useful. And because for our case, we didn't use in the EIG for our laser regions. Okay, great, thank you. Um, next question that is coming here. So, is breaking all of the retinal layers important to CMV formation? Uh, literally, the C CMV, the laser shots for the CMV will not break any retinal layers because the retina, they are transparent. They didn't absorb any energy from the laser. So the laser shot will only uh, break through the bruise membrane. But uh, uh, also, the and we folks, we need a uh, very fine focus on these founders. So we focus on the bruise membrane. And, uh, uh, but the exclusive laser shot, they will go through the bruise membrane and damage the choroidal or the uh, ERG layer because this layer, they have color and they can absorb energy. Uh, generally, it's very uh, important that we focus very well on the founders and uh, only bruise membrane, uh, the bruise membrane. Great. Great. Thank you again, Dr. Gong. And uh, a question has come in, which is a bit more, uh, you know, centered on the technology. Uh, the question was, what is the size, the laser spot size on the Micron 3? And, it, and the question is whether or not that is different than the, so the size on the Micron 4. Perhaps, Scott, you'd be uh, willing to take this one? Uh, 
Yeah, I can take this. So thank you for the question. So the, the apparatus, actually, image-guided laser photocoagulation system is the same for both systems, for the Micron 4 and the Micron 3. So the actual minimum size is 50 microns, and that's based on the diameter of the, the fiber that we use. So it will be exactly the same for both systems. Great, great, thank you. Um, I'm sure the audience will be happy to hear that. Now, back to uh, back to more questions about your your uh, your research, Dr. Gong. Uh, someone has asked, how do you statistically analyze the FFA images? Uh, could could you could you repeat that? What? Sure. Yes. Yes. Um, okay. How do you statistically analyze the FFA images? Okay. The the F uh, we uh, IP, IP injects those uh, foreign style into the mice. Uh, usually we did it seven days after photocalculation. And after that, we uh, using the, just, just in using the microscope on the micro platform to uh, investigate the uh, fluorescence in the retina and uh, in, in a mouse eye. And we uh, usually take uh, photos at different time points, and we compare the uh, vision leakage between the different time points to uh, grade the vision leakage. And the uh, IOVS paper by published by uh, our lab uh, last year, we uh, provide detailed information how we grade in those uh, vision leakage. Great, great. Thank you very much. Um, so I think you know we have a ton of questions coming in, which is great, uh, and and they've all kind of flooded in near the end. So uh, we really appreciate that. And 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 again, if we don't get to answering your question today, we will not get to all of these. Uh, again, please keep in mind we will um, you know have all these answer these questions answered by by Dr. Gong and, and Scott at Phoenix, and we'll have the question and answer report sent out. Um, so we'll ask a couple more. Uh, one question that's come in, and, and I've seen actually a, a bit of a trend here. People have been asking about different animal models, and I, I understand that this is, you know, your research, Dr. Gong, was focused on mice. Um, we've had questions about, you know, this type of uh, model and research on uh, rats and then actually larger animals. I, someone actually asked about, um, has, have you guys ever looked at this uh, in, in the dog model? So. I'm not sure if Dr. Gong or Scott, you'd be, you know, uh, maybe both of you can can chime in on this. Uh, have, have you have you either looked at this for different animal models? Yeah, uh, yeah I can answer this for Dr. Gong. So uh, unfortunately, with the system, it's designed for rodents. Uh, so at this point, that's what we've been using it for. Um, clearly, the technology and the application has widespread use. Uh, we certainly are uh, always in development here at Phoenix, uh, but at this point in time, it's primarily mice and rats. Okay, great. But you and you do have some users because uh, we did have the rat question come in a few times. But some users, you know, this this system is is fully functional to four rats, and you have some users doing that. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, we also have uh, some researchers. Back to one of your earlier questions, they're evaluating uh, those particular lesions in the C and B models with ERG. So we're getting multiple uses from the same animal model. Great, great. I'm sure our audience will be happy to hear that. Um, and all right, so why don't we we'll move on to our last question for today, um, and and we'll we'll direct this back towards Dr. Gong, and I'll ask uh, Dr. Gong, what is your your next set of experiments that you're thinking of trying with this, you know, this, in this application space with these technologies? Yeah, we may try some. Uh, diff uh, Different uh, drugs or some uh, or mechanicals to see if they have some effects on the, uh, especially the protective effects on the neovascular AMD, and we want to see uh, they have some beneficial effects on the laser induced CMV. They could uh, decrease the CMV lesions and uh, decrease the lesion leakage. Yeah, that's our next plan for uh, this. Uh, application of this mouse model. 